Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Once again, uh, this morning as we uh, continue to look at the, the topic of kindness, uh, I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you that in just a couple of days we're celebrating Valentine's Day, right? Last warning, guys. If you haven't planned by now, I can't help you. Uh, last warning. So uh, in a couple of days, it is, it is Valentine's Day, and uh, I love looking back at, at how these things kind of get started. If you, if you peel back all the, the history and all the, the trappings that go along with Valentine's Day, and you go back into the, the lore and the history of, of the church, you find a man by the name of Valentine who lived in the 3rd century, so in the 200s A.D., and he was a bishop in the middle of Italy, in a small town in the midi middle of Italy, meaning that he ran the church for them. Well, during that time, there was an emperor by the name of Claudius II. Now, Claudius was realizing that his Roman legions were getting a little bit thin as they were fighting the barbarians in Germania. And um, in order to replenish the ranks, Claudius decided he was going to do a conscription of troops of men to go into the Roman legions. Well, there was an exception in the, the Roman law that would allow men who had just been married to be exempt from being conscripted into the Roman legions. Uh, they believed that a man should be home and he should have children before he has to go off and, and fight. Well, in order to get around that, Claudius also issued an edict that people couldn't get married. Yeah, he's pretty smart. He was thinking ahead, right? He wanted all those soldiers. Well, Valentine heard the edicts of the emperor and decided that he was going to marry people anyway. Christians who came to him, uh, he was going to, to allow them to get married. He was going to help them to get married. He was going to help them to pay the exorbitant fees in order to get married, to defy the Roman emperor's uh, edicts. And eventually, Valentine got himself in trouble and got hauled before the emperor himself. Well, the emperor's household actually liked Valentine quite a bit. Uh, unfortunately, when he tried to convert Claudius to Christianity, uh, the emperor became enraged and on February 14th had Valentine whipped and flogged and beaten and executed, uh, which is why we celebrate Valentine's Day on February 14th. At least that's the, the story that I've heard about, about Valentine. But you know, the reason why Valentine was such a defender of marriage and why he was uh, such a staunch uh, proponent of, of love had nothing to do with cupids and chubby babies with wings flying around shooting people with arrows. Uh, that had nothing to do with his, the reason why he did what he did. The reason why he stood up for, for marriages in the Roman Empire, the reason why he married people in defiance of the government was because of the love of Jesus Christ in his heart and life because he had been touched when he was young by the grace of God, by the kindness and goodness of God, and because he believed that it was his duty to stand and to preach about the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ that reaches out to all people. So it is a great story if you go back and, and look at, at what we can tell about, about Valentine. And since, you know, so much of our, our focus today is on, or this week is on our closest relationships, I thought it'd be good if we talked a little bit about what kindness looks like in our closest relationships. What does it look like to demonstrate the same kind of kindness that touched the life of, of Valentine? What does it demonstrate, or what does it look like to demonstrate the, the kindness that God has shown us as we interact with people around us? Well, we started this last week, this idea of looking at, at kindness, and I shared with you last week that there's the story in the Gospels that Jesus tells of the prodigal son. And actually, that parable should be really the story of the prodigal sons, right? Because in the story, you have a father and you have two sons who are both equally separated from their father. One is separated by his sin and his wild living. The other is separated by his pride and his arrogance in his anger at his father. Both of them are outside of where their father wants them. They're excluding themselves from his presence. And so the father, rather than writing them off, rather than being angry at them in return, what does the father do? The father offers kindness, right? 
he is constantly reaching out to these boys of his, constantly inviting them back into the family, back into his presence. And that is a, a parable that Jesus gives us about how God is always seeking us out. He is always extending kindness to us. Whichever direction we may be running from him, whether we're running into the wildness of sin or whether we're riding it, or running into the, the wildness of our, uh, of our arrogance and pride and, and self-righteousness, either way, God is always reaching out to us in kindness, inviting us back into relationship. And because God has been so kind to us, because the Father is reaching out to us, his prodigal children, it's a challenge for us as well in that parable that we need to be like our master. It's the goal of a disciple, right? We need to be like our master. We need to show that same kind of kindness to other people. And we need to show that same kind of kindness universally as God shows it to us not be selective with it like we typically tend to be. So what does it look like then to demonstrate this kind of extravagant kindness that God has for us? What does that look like in, in our lives? What kind of actions does that entail? What kind of an attitude do we need to adopt in order to be more like Jesus, to be more kind, especially within our families? You know, you think that it would be easiest within our families to be more kind, right? But let's be honest with each other here this morning. It's not, is it? Because it's within our closest relationships that those people know how to push every one of our buttons, right? They know how to aggravate us more than anyone else on the face of the earth. And it is hard to be kind. And it's within our closest relationships that we often think they don't deserve kindness. It is hard for us to do, isn't it? So what does that actually look like? What has to change within our minds to, to be more kind like God has been kind to us? Well, I want to share with you a story that comes kind of between the pages of the New Testament, a story that you really have to kind of dig into the New Testament a little bit to, to understand. And it's probably a story that most of us have, have never really looked at or never really thought about, which is unfortunate because it is truly a revolutionary story that happens uh, behind the pages of the New Testament. And the story deals with the Apostle Paul as he was traveling through Greece. He stopped at the city of Colossae. Now, we know that because, of course, Paul later writes a letter to the church in Colossae. We call it Colossians. Well, as Paul was in Colossae, and actually, I'm sorry, it's not in Greece. It was in, it's in Turkey is where the city of Colossae was, uh, right in the region where uh, the earthquake uh, happened this last week. So make sure that we remember to keep all the, the families and victims of the earthquakes uh, in our prayers. But he, he, he stopped at the city of Colossae. And at the city of Colossae, Paul started preaching the gospel of Jesus. There are, there are three cities that are all like sister cities right there in that region. In fact, if you stand in the center one, you can see the other two uh, on the horizon. Uh, there's Colossae, there's Hierapolis, and there is Laodicea, which we also know from the Bible, from the book of Revelation. Uh, Paul stopped in that city, and when, when Paul was there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he, he did his normal thing where he set up house churches within the city, where they would come together and they would worship in the morning before everyone went off to work. They would gather together. They'd hold each other accountable. They would share the good news of Jesus. They would share meals together, whether they were Jews or Greeks or, or any nationality. Paul set up these little communities of Christ within each city that he went to. Well, as Paul was preaching about Jesus, in one of those house churches was a man by the name of Philemon. And Philemon became a Christian. Uh, Philemon was fairly well-to-do. Uh, he became a Christian, his wife became a Christian, his children became Christians, and in fact, even his household slaves became Christians. They were all following after Jesus, all trying to grow in their faith and, and learn from Paul. Well, Paul was preaching the same message that he preached everywhere he went, that in Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, there is no slave nor free, there is no male or female, we are all equal in the face of God. We are all equal under his grace. Well, after Paul moves on from Colossae and that message of Christ really starts taking root, sometime or another around the time that Paul gets arrested 
and thrown in jail in the city of Rome, back in Colossae, something happens in the household of Philemon. One of his most trusted household slaves, a man by the name of Onesimus, takes to heart what Paul had said about how we are all equal in Christ. And in order to be equal, in order to be free and on equal standing with other Christians, he thinks the ends justify the means, and what he does is that he steals from his master and he runs away to get his freedom. Now, in the Roman society, much as in colonial America, that was punishable by death. If Philemon was ever caught, or if, if Onesimus was ever caught by Philemon, Onesimus could be executed for running away and stealing from his master. Well, Onesimus ends up running to Rome where Paul is. And while Paul has been arrested in Rome, everyone that Paul has worked with over the years... All the people who supported him, all the people who encouraged him, all the people who stood by his side. When Paul gets arrested and he's thrown in prison in Rome awaiting execution, they scatter, just like the disciples scattered when Jesus was arrested. Paul is stuck in prison all by himself practically. No one wants to be associated with him. They're embarrassed because Paul is in prison. They're thinking he's setting a bad example for the gospel. They're worried that if they get too close to him, they're going to be executed as well. So Paul is, is struggling. He can't provide for himself. He's stuck in prison. There is one person who comes and stands with Paul. Somehow or another, Onesimus finds out what's happened to Paul. And he goes to Rome and stands with Paul. He provides for Paul. He works so that Paul can be provided for. He does everything that he can to strengthen and encourage Paul. And we know all this because in the book of, of Colossians, Paul writes about it. How encouraging Onesimus has been to him. And so eventually, it comes to the point where Paul is writing back to the city of Colossae, to all those churches, including Philemon's church, and he sends the letter of Colossians back to them. We're told at the end of that, that letter that Paul is sending this letter back with Onesimus, that this runaway slave, Paul is sending him back to the household that he ran away from with this new letter of Colossians to give to them. And in his back pocket, by the way, is a second letter that Paul has written that we have in our New Testament called the letter of Philemon. Because Paul knows what he's sending Onesimus back into, into the situation that he's sending him back into. And so he sends this letter of Philemon directly to Onesimus' former master, encouraging him to recognize that he and Onesimus are brothers in Christ, not master and slave, but brothers. And this is an absolutely revolutionary letter that Paul writes. It undercuts the whole Roman slave system. And I, I wish it was a letter that, that we in America had taken more seriously early on in our history because it speaks so much against slavery and against this idea that, that people are unequal. Uh, we could have avoided a lot of ugliness, a lot of evil in our own history if we had taken this to heart. So I want to share with you some of Philemon. It's a really short letter. In fact, we could read the whole thing this morning, but uh, I didn't want to put all those slides into the computer today. Uh, we're going to read verses 4 through 10 for our scripture reading. And I want you to hear what Paul says to Philemon. Remember, this is a letter carried by Onesimus, his former slave, who's coming back and giving this to Philemon, a personal message from Paul as it impacts Onesimus and as he shares the, the implications of the reality of the gospel in the life of Philemon. So this is Philemon, and it's verses 4 through 10, because there's only one chapter. You know, it's verses 4 through 10. So if you want to follow along in your Bible or on your Bible app, uh, you're welcome to do so. Paul writes, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your faith has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could command it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. 
But because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. So these are Paul's instructions. He goes on to, to encourage Philemon to set Onesimus free, to forgive him. And if there's anything that Onesimus owes to his former master, that Paul will take it upon himself, bear the burden himself. Like I said, it's absolutely revolutionary to the whole understanding of the Roman uh, slavery system and, and the equality of, of all people under the grace of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Now... This letter was revolutionary not only in what it said, but it was also revolutionary in the life of Onesimus. Can you imagine what he was going through as Paul sent him back to Colossae? So he had to sail from Rome around Italy, across the Aegean Sea, and over to central Turkey. The whole time that he is traveling with these letters, he knows that if he shows up and Philemon chooses to press charges, at the very worst, he could be executed. At the very best, he could be forced back into slavery in Philemon's household. This is not a good-looking situation for Philemon. For Ernestus, I mean. This is not a good situation for him. He has to dread every mile of that journey as he goes back to Colossae. But it is an act of kindness. In, fa in fact, there are several acts of, of kindness among the three of these. And this is, a, this is an important story, by the way, too, because Onesimus, I should tell you that he goes on from Colossae to become a leader in the church. He moves from Colossae eventually to Ephesus, and over time he becomes the bishop of the city of Ephesus one of the, the greatest centers of Christianity in the ancient world, second only to, to Rome itself. He becomes the leader of the church there. He becomes bishop after Timothy and the apostle John. Then it's Onesimus, this former slave who becomes the leader. So it's a great story for him, but it had to be an awful, awful trip. So what do we learn about, about kindness here? You know, one of the things that we see about, about kindness is that when Paul sends Onesimus back, when he does this act of kindness, it is a huge sacrifice for Paul to make. It is a huge sacrifice. Onesimus is his only source of strength, his only support, his only encouragement. And so for Paul to send Onesimus back, he has to sacrifice in order for the good of Philemon and for the good of Onesimus. He has to give up what he needs. He has to give up what he wants. And, and kindness always involves sacrifice from us. For Philemon to be kind, he too has to sacrifice. He has to give up on his right for vengeance, his, his right to reestablish his place in the community. He has to give up on the money that he lost. He has to give up on the, uh, how people view him. He has to sacrifice all of that for the sake of being kind to Onesimus. You can't have an act of kindness without it involving some kind of sacrifice from us. Kindness always involves sacrifice. You have to put aside what you want for the sake of someone else. But you know, kindness goes beyond that. Because just putting aside our wants for the needs of someone else, that's what we call being nice. Kindness and niceness are not the same things. Kindness goes a lot deeper than just being nice to people around us. You know, we usually think of, of being nice as just, um, you know, feeling good, it's warm fuzzies, it's hugs, it's, it's all those, those good kinds of things. We, think that we, we kind of equate that with, with the idea of kindness. Paul understands there's something deeper to kindness. It's almost like, you know, you and I think of kindness and we think of, you know, from when I was growing up, we think of Mr. Rogers, right? We, we think of Mr. Rogers as this, this, this really kind person. Great theologian, by the way. Uh, but in reality, Mr. Rogers would actually tell you that kindness 
and niceness is not the same thing. You can be nice and not actually be kind. And you can be kind without always being nice to people. There's a different level of kindness. In, in fact, Mr. Rogers is making the circle again uh, on the internet this last week um, because people were shocked that he wasn't as nice as we thought he was. He was kind instead. There's a video going around about uh, around from Mr. Rogers that has infuriated so many people in our world because Mr. Rogers sang a song that said, only girls can be the mommies, only boys can be the daddies. In our society anymore, that's not nice. But it was kind because he was telling the truth. There's a difference between kindness and niceness. And, and Mr. Rogers realized that. We should realize that. Paul realized that. Philemon realized that. Onesimus realized that in the story. Because as good as it was for Paul to send Onesimus back to Philemon, as good as it was for Philemon, this was tough for Onesimus. This was hard for Onesimus to go through. Knowing what could face him. Knowing that this idea this, that Paul's act of kindness hurt. It hurt. It, it was hard, but, but Paul knew that what was best for Onesimus, if he was going to be the leader that God wanted him to be eventually down the road, if he was going to be the leader who could lead the church in Ephesus, although Paul might never have, have seen that in his lifetime, never have imagined that Onesimus could end up there, but Paul knew that if he was going to be the kind of person that he needed to be in the future, he had to get things right between himself and Philemon. He couldn't live and couldn't be the kind of person God called him to be if he had this theft and the, the running away on his conscience day after day. He had to make it right. And so even though it was hard for Onesimus to do, even though it hurt, even though it was scary, even though it was frightening, even though it meant risking his life, Paul's kindness was shown to Onesimus. You know, kindness isn't always what we want. Kindness isn't always what we like, what we enjoy, certainly not what we deserve. But kindness is always what's best for us. And so Paul knew what was right. He knew what was best for Onesimus to go back and clean the slate with his former master. And he knew what was right for Philemon to forgive Onesimus even though it would hurt to do so, and it would shame him to do so. You see, most of us wouldn't associate kindness with correction or accountability, but there's a deeper level to kindness. Kindness can be tough. Kindness can, can hurt sometimes, even, to receive it. And it's not just because we're sacrificing for the sake of someone else. It's because we don't always want to do what is right. We don't always want what is best for us. But kindness is being absolutely committed to what's best for other people. Now, some of you may be thinking that sounds a lot like love. And you are absolutely correct. It is a lot like love. It's a lot like tough love being absolutely committed to what's good for someone else. In fact, kindness is love put into action. That's exactly what it is. It is love lived out in your actions for the sake of someone else. When we're called to be kind, that's what we mean. Put your love into action. Live out that commitment to put someone else before you. And that's what Paul is teaching Onesimus. It's what Paul is teaching Philemon. It's what Paul is teaching us if we're willing to listen and learn from this story. Kindness is living out what is best for other people, even if it means sacrificing for yourself. So I have a, a couple of challenges for you here this morning. First of all, I want you to think within your families, within your closest relationships, and I want you to ask yourself, how can you show kindness in your families? How can you live out that commitment to do what is best for the people that you're closest to? 
whether they deserve it or not, whether they've earned it, whether they're kind in return, how can you do what is best for them? Maybe that means, you know, that you're going to be kind and encouraging with your words. Maybe it means you're going to be attentive, even if the Super Bowl's on this afternoon. You're going to be attentive to conversation. Maybe it means you're going to be present with your spouse more or with your children more. But you can't get that time back, you know. What do you need to do to be kind in your families? I want you to think about that. I want you to pray about that. And I want you to commit yourself to doing that this week, to living in that loving kindness that God has shown you. That same kind of attention, that same kind of sacrifice, that same kind of willingness to serve, that same kind of desire to put others' needs in front of yourself, show it in your actions. And that's the first challenge I have for you. The second challenge is, is something a little bit different. I want to extend it beyond just our immediate families and our closest relationships. I want to extend it out to our, our family here as a church. How can we be kind to one another here at church? How can we be kind in our interactions? How can we be kind in the things that we do for each other? And in fact, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to a, a new ministry that we're, we're starting here at our church. It's a ministry that's called Kindness Matters. Those of you who've been in Sunday school over the last couple of weeks, you've probably heard a little bit about this. Uh, Judy Mason has gone around to our different Sunday school classes and has talked about this idea. The idea is that we want to match the needs of our church with the skills and abilities that we have. So if you need something done, we want to be able to, to show kindness as a church, to have people within our church who are willing to step up and help you with those needs, to show kindness, to put your needs in front of their own. In order to do that, in order to match the skills and abilities of this church with the, the needs of people in this church, we are starting uh, this morning and, and over the last couple of weeks, we're starting this idea of, of collecting the skills and abilities, the areas in which you are willing to help someone else, the areas in which you are willing to show kindness. And we're keeping track of all those. There's, there's actually a form on the table underneath the stained glass window. It says kindness matters right on the top of it. If, you're, if you feel like God is calling you to be more kind, to use your skills and abilities to help other people, I want to encourage you to take one of those forms, fill it out. You can drop it in the lockbox that's there on that table. Uh, just indicate the kinds of things that you can do to help other people. And then we're going to take all those skills and abilities and we're going to match them to needs as they come up here in our church. Because we want to demonstrate the kindness of God. When you and I start demonstrating the kindness of God, sacrificing for one another, putting each other's needs in front of ourselves, that is a blazing arrow that points directly to the God that we serve and shows the goodness of how he's treated us. So I want to put those challenges before you here this morning. I want to challenge you to be more like Jesus, more like our God who is kind to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you that you treat us so much better than we deserve. Lord, I want to thank you for your kindness. I want to thank you, Lord, that you put my needs in front of your own. You didn't have to go to that cross. You didn't have to suffer and die for the sins that I commit. And yet you love me enough that you did. And you did the same thing for each and every one of us. You loved us enough to take our place, to demonstrate kindness, mercy, grace, love to us. Lord, I want to show that same kindness to everyone around me. I want to show people that, that I am yours whether it's in our families, Lord, whether it's among our friends, our coworkers, whether it's even among the people that we meet in the community around us. Lord, we want to show your goodness, your kindness. And Lord, we confess we haven't done it. Lord, most of the time we blow it on our own. 
we're so selective, we're so arrogant in showing kindness only to those we think deserve it or that can give it to us in return. Lord, we're sorry. We are so sorry that we have taken such a beautiful gift that you've given us and kept it to ourselves. God, we commit ourselves this morning that we're going to live for you. We're going to be yours. We're going to be one church under one God with one mission, to share the love of Jesus with this community, to share your kindness, because we know that is a blazing arrow that points directly to you. So God, we pray that you'd move in our hearts, seal that commitment within our hearts as we give you our lives here today. In Jesus' name we pray.